The name Perkins, carved in stone. Below a Gothic tower, a boy navigates with a cane. A title, The Education for All Initiative, with Larry Campbell. The International Council for Education of People with Visual Impairment, an organization with an ungodly <laughs> difficult name to get your hands around, better known as ICEVI, um, was founded in 1952 and for I would say the first 80 percent of its history focused its attention on the exchange of ideas and information amongst educators and administrators who were working with children with visual impairment. So much of our attention was focused on children who were receiving an education. In the early part of the 21st century we began to wonder whether or not we should be shifting our emphasis and trying to focus more attention on the needs of the children, the vast majority of them, uh, who had no access to education. Um, there are about six million visually impaired children in the world. Um, about 4.8 million of those children live in low and middle income countries. And on average, less than 10% of kids in developing countries have access to education, visually impaired children, that is. In the foreground of a photograph, we see a teacher in a green sari standing in front of a classroom. She has her arms raised. A large number of children, perhaps 30 or more, stand and face her, some of the children with their arms up as well. Among the children is a young boy in a red checked shirt who is visually impaired. He wears thick round glasses. Some countries are doing better, some a lot worse. Uh, the biggest problems are in Sub-Saharan Africa and in South Asia. So the, the executive committee of the organization, which consists of regional representation plus the international donor organization, uh, undertook this global campaign called Education for All Children with Visual Impairment. It was meant to try to infuse with into, the broad, into the broad Education for All initiative founded in 1990 by the World Bank, UNESCO, and UNICEF, the needs of children with disabilities. Um, so that's the sort of history of this global campaign uh, to try to uh, increase, dramatically increase access to those kids in developing countries who up until now have had no access to education. Fade to black. A graphic of the Perkins logo swoops across the screen revealing a chapter heading. Laying the groundwork. We needed to make sure that the campaigns were being led by governments because up until this point, much or almost all of what was accomplished was being done through non-government organizations. Now their contributions are significant and I don't want to minimize them, but unless something has government buy-in, then it's never going to result in systemic change. And as soon as you and the resources go away, the program goes away. So our goal was to infuse this within the Education for All programs of these developing countries. We set criteria for what kinds of countries. We knew that, you know, we're a small organization. We were not, we knew that we couldn't tackle everything in a short period of time. So we set criteria and we had all of the stakeholders came together and created those criteria. You know, is there an active organization of blind people in the country? Uh, is there a, a network uh, or a system of some sort to educate teachers? Is there a, a, an ability to produce educational materials? In a photograph of a classroom in Thailand, we see a teacher assisting four young boys who are blind or visually impaired and are learning to read Braille. One boy who wears glasses uses a Perkins Brailler. Two other boys are reading pages of Braille, and the fourth student is examining a large model of a Braille cell that uses bright yellow discs to represent the raised dots. Kids aren't educated internationally or regionally. They're educated in their own countries, in their own communities. And for every country where we work, there has to be a national task force. That national task force must be led by the Ministry of Education. It must involve parents of children with disabilities. It must include blind and low vision people, teachers, university professors, 
I mean, this is a, a stakeholder group that establishes the National Plan of Action. In a photograph of a classroom for visually impaired students in Costa Rica, we see four young students sitting in chairs, each directly across from a teacher or a teacher's aide. The teacher and aides are smiling and playing various instruments like a tambourine and a shaker. In the background, we see several brightly colored tangible symbols displayed on a black felt board. Essentially, what we can do is provide guidance. We can share our experience in what has and has worked in other countries. If it didn't work here, it doesn't mean it's not going to work in your country, but let me just tell you what happened when we tried this here. If you want to try it, that's, that's fine. Uh, maybe it will work here. So this is a program that is built from the national level upward, and ICVI is the facilitating organization that's trying to make that happen, not the organization that's actually doing it. So at, at every level of this, uh, we are working only with and through local uh, ministries of education, local non-government organization, local disabled people's organization. Fade to black. Raising awareness and raising expectations. One of the critical issues, particularly in developing countries, is that many parents of children with visual impairment do not think it's worthwhile or possible even to educate a child with a visual impairment, let alone a child with multiple disabilities. And so one of the big hurdles to overcome is to make sure that the stakeholders that are involved, parents of children with visual impairment and disabled people's organizations themselves were actively engaged and involved in the campaign. In a photograph, a young boy who is multiply disabled, including a visual impairment, sits in a classroom in Uruguay. The chair has a high back and sides which envelop the boy, who is also supported by a pillow. The added stability allows him to reach out for a blue plastic ring, which his teacher offers. Well, one of, the, one of the major partners in this initiative is the World Blind Union, which is an organization, the international organization of blind people. And one of the most effective ways of changing a parent's attitudes is for them to see someone from their own culture, from their own area, from their own province perhaps, who has succeeded, yet has a visual impairment. And many parents just have never, ever been exposed to that. And so we're working closely with the World Blind Union and its affiliates at the national level to try to expose parents to positive role models so that that parent looks and says, wow, maybe that could be my child. I mean, for years we've, we've used role models from Europe, from the United States, and the attitude of the parent is, well, that's wonderful, but you know, the streets are paved in gold there, why wouldn't that happen? Uh, so what we really need to do is work with local uh, organizations to demonstrate what's possible. In a photograph, a group of students, several of whom are blind and hold white canes, stands outside the Perkins Brailer Repair Workshop and Parts Depot in Nairobi, Kenya. There are also a number of adults in the picture. The workshop trains technicians, including persons who are blind, to repair brailers. And, uh, you know, most parents, I don't care where they are, they want the best for their child. And, frankly, many of them think the best for a child is just to simply keep them home, fed, and comfortable. They, they, they don't understand the potentials that a child with a visual impairment could have. So when exposed to a blind or a low vision person who is independent and is contributing to their own community, they think, maybe that could be my child. And what was the key? What's, what's this, what separates my child from what that individual has been able to do? And for all of us, it's the same, education. In a photograph, a teacher is instructing a young Lebanese girl who is blind how to communicate by tactile signing. The girl is wearing a black headscarf, or hajib. With her left hand, she interprets the sign the teacher presents, and with her right hand, she imitates that sign. Behind them on the wall, the different letters of the sign alphabet are represented with brightly colored construction paper cutouts of hands.
Oh, there are other factors, but education is the, is the primary issue here. Um, and parents, parents recognize that and uh, I think then want to seek it. We also, we, uh, not enough resources have gone into organizing parent associations and we need to do much more of that because parents can be a pretty powerful political influence. If we look in almost any country at positive legislation that's moved the agenda forward, uh, if you look at the Americans with Disability Act, what were the driving forces behind it? They were parents, they were disabled people themselves. Yes, the educators were there, but very often when the educators are pushing for th something, it's seen as self-serving. No, you're just trying to keep your own job and make your own life a little easier. But parents have relatives and relatives have votes. So politicians have begun to recognize that parents are a strong voice with political influence. And so organizing parent groups is, is another strategy. Fade to black. Educating teachers. The next big challenge is capacity building teachers. Um, and that has to happen at the pre-service level and at the in-service level. Um, we are including children in classrooms in their own community school and those regular classroom teachers often have a very rudimentary level of education themselves. So every government in every country where we work has tried different strategies. They have to sort that out themselves. Uh, we don't have a single formula that works for all. Uh, but if you take a country like Vietnam where we probably had the greatest success, at least if you look at the numbers of children reached in the last five years, uh, Part of that success was the fact that they had a strong education for all national program. That is a program to reach all children with primary education. We see in a photograph a dozen or more preschool aged children sitting in a semicircle on a tiled floor. A woman wearing a nun's headpiece sits among them with a young boy in her lap. The boy, who is visually impaired, holds a brightly colored plastic toy in his right hand. Two, within that national plan, they had a plan infused in the broad plan for children with disabilities. And so what we had to do was simply become the technical agent to help them do that job better. And there we started at university levels with the trainer of trainers who then prepared specialists at the district level who could work with and train the local classroom teachers. But you can't expect that classroom teacher with a very rudimentary education uh, to uh, not need some level of assistance and support. So the program requires in-service education for those individuals and ongoing support from a, a teacher with more specialization. Fade to black. Adapting resources. First and foremost, um, because we're talking about developing countries where resources are very, very limited. One of the things we try to always include in the training of the teachers is how can you adapt what's available right in your own environment and use those as teaching tools? Because they don't have the luxury of going through a catalog and ordering things per se. But there are some basic pieces of equipment, brailers, slates and styluses, um, abacus, uh, low vision aids, magnifiers, etc. Uh, something as simple as a thick uh, a felt tipped pen uh, can be a huge help for a child with low vision. In a photograph taken inside a classroom in Turkey, we see a young girl who is blind sitting at a low table. The table is covered in green finger paint and a small pile of small cylinders of uncooked pasta. The girl, who wears a pink sweater, is using the pasta to swirl patterns into the finger paint. We need access to high quality, low cost learning materials. That has improved somewhat over the last 10 years or so. The big problem beyond the materials being available is the distribution system. Can you get the material to the kid who needs it when he or she needs it? You know, we have places that produce Braille books, but if the child is not getting the book until the last month of school, you know, the, the child is not 
working on a level playing field with his or her classmates. We see in a photograph several boys sitting at desks inside a classroom in China. One boy sits at an empty desk with his hands folded, while behind him his classmate, who is blind, has a large braille book open in front of him. So this is a big challenge, a very big challenge, and uh, it's not one that's simple, but technology is beginning to change those things because today we can produce Braille much, much more quickly with and do it sometimes right at the local level with something as simple as a netbook computer and uh, a printer. Fade to black. Measuring success. When I went through where what we've achieved to date, 17,000 uh, teachers and parents reach with capacity building programs, 50,000 kids in school. Big success story? Yes and no. Uh, there's still a lot that needs to be done. The quality of what is going on in these educational programs is still very iffy. I mean, I think we've, we've made some headway. I think we've broken some barriers down, but we, have, we cannot lose sight of the fact that we need to reach a higher level of quality and we really need to uh, be working in partnership with broader agencies. I think to remain in our own narrow arena um, is kind of uh, self-satisfying, but in the long run is not going to uh, achieve the, the ultimate, ultimate goal of reaching all of these kids who, who have a basic right to, to education. I mean, that is a basic human right that so many kids today are being denied, and uh, that must change. In a photograph, a young Filipino girl, who is multiply disabled, sits in a wheelchair that provides support for her head. She gazes at a woman who sits nearby. On a table in front of them is a mixing bowl and a cupcake pan filled with chocolate batter. Next, we see six students in a classroom in Bangladesh. Three of the students, two girls and a boy, are wearing hearing aids. First of all, when you go to agencies like UNESCO and UNICEF and others, their argument, and it's understandable, well, we can't do this for you because then the deaf community will want this and the developmental disabled folks will want this and so forth. Um, I think the time has come, based on the lessons we've learned over the past five years, to begin to find ways to work with some of the broader development agencies, Save the Children, World Vision come to mind as two organizations that do very substantial work in basic education in many, many developing countries. Now, if we are working with and through those organizations, we can take our technical expertise and help them to do, they look good, we look good. So it's a win-win situation, and most importantly, kids are, more kids are getting into school. Fade to black.